So, anything that rises is bound to fall and give birth to something new. This cycle has repeated several times in our all our histories and why I am making this philosophical statement is I want to answer this question whether India also can rise like a phoenix from the ashes and chart a path towards its destiny of being a developed nation. So, are we today a developed nation? Let us see. Our per capita income today is about 2200 US dollars. The cutoff for being a developed country today is about 22,000 US dollars. So, it is a long journey. But our Prime Minister wishes that we should be a developed nation by 2047, 100 years of our independence. Then we ha will have to be a 20 to 25 trillion US dollar economy from the 3 trillion dollar US economy uh, that we are today. So, the problem definition is something like this. Can we be a developed nation by 2047? And to answer this question, let us first look a little bit back in our history. I will flash something in here. So, what I am showing over here is the Kailas temple from Ellora Caves. So, technical problems. Yeah, then over here is the uh, facade of a Haveli from Jaisalmer in Rajasthan, Tanjavur temple. This list can go on and on. In fact, you can go right back up to the Indus Valley civilization and you will find such monuments strewn across our landscape. Why am I telling you all this? Because there is a common thread here, excellence. There is no semblance of any compromise, chalta hai attitude, jugad in these monuments. You see only perfection. And it is our ancestors, our predecessors who have created these monuments. So, what kind of people were they? Now, let us look at these modern monuments seen from it, any city. So, how did we get from here to here? If we can get a key to this, we may be able to answer the question that I have posed. So, let us revisit the Kailas temple. This temple was sculpted in a monolith, single rock, top to bottom and must have taken about 20 years, would mean about two generations at that time. Now, imagine there were no communication tools, no visualization tools that we have today. So, how was this feat achieved? What kind of people were they who achieved this feat? Can we not say that we were a developed nation then as compared to the rest of the world if you look at these monuments and we are talking about a period of few, several thousand years. We can ask similar questions everywhere. So, were we not a developed nation then? If you look at it logically, uh, try to analyze it logically, then what I feel is we would, uh, there must have been a prolonged period of peace and prosperity right across India. Because only happy people can create some phenomenal testimonies like this in art, culture, sculpture, etc. In fact, Indian society and India would be like a developed nation, people from a developed nation today or even better. So, then what happened? Many of us attribute foreign invasions for our downfall. But that I think is a very, very simplistic argument. In fact, before the British landed here, we were doing pretty well. If you objectively look at the Mughal period, our economy was at its zenith, maybe the highest, one amongst the highest in the world. And we can see in terms of patronage for Hindustani classical music, sculpture, art at that time. So, we have to agree that colonization really killed our economy, it killed our culture, our education system. But the worst thing that happened was colonization enslaved us here. So, they killed our thought process and we have not gotten out of that mentality even today. If you try to analyze this further, then what is it that we need to do to get out of this situation? 
if we have to become a developed nation in another two decades because if you look at our history since independence that is about 76 years there have been instances of excellence like the green revolution of the 60s the IT revolution of the 90s more recently the Delhi Metro and so on what these examples tell us is that if there is a will there is a way things can change but can we leapfrog to becoming a developed nation in just two decades if that has to happen then each one of us all citizens have to contribute and contribute consistently for a period of 20 years just like our ancestors built the Kailash temple. So what is it that needs to be done to become a developed nation? I believe the biggest investment any society, any nation can do is in healthcare and education. And this has been quite patchy over, uh, if, you, if you look at it. A educated population, a healthy population is the most productive and most efficient. But what do we find here? Governments have consistently outsourced healthcare and education. I am standing in a private college. We send our kids to non-government funded schools and colleges. We go for treatment to non-government funded hospitals. This is the norm. This has to stop and stop quickly because if you look at it, today we have the demographic dividend on our side. But this is, if you look at the future, this that is more younger people than older people is going to change over a period of time. So we cannot waste any time. And any change in these domains are long gestation. 10 years, 15 years before they start showing results. So we need massive government investment and certainly some creative out of the box thinking to solve this problem. Now what this denial of education and healthcare has done to a whole swath of population in our country is that they have been denied opportunity. I am sure there is no dearth of talent in India, but they have been denied opportunity so India and Indians cannot perform to their potential. Just look at what Indians do when they go abroad in so many fields. IPL is another classic example that if given an opportunity to showcase your talent, people do really well. So these are the two pillars that need immediate attention. But then there is a third side to it, third pillar. Any table needs three legs to stand upon. So that third leg is the rule of law. Here we cannot just depend on the government to deliver, but all of us have, have to pitch in. Of course, the government has to implement the rule of law. But again, what do we see is a depressing scenario over here. We can just step out on the streets outside and you will see all permutations and combinations of law breaking going on. Four guys on a motorcycle, talking on the cell phone, going on the wrong side through a no entry, jumping a red light, common sight. So, if we have to make a difference as good citizens, then we should start with these small things and they will eventually add up to something big. After all, if we all live ethical lifestyles, ideally, then we will not be wasting time on stupid non-productive things and we will be contributing positively to society and end up being responsible. Let me tell you, responsible behavior is the most sought after and rare commodity today. So let's assume that these things start falling in place. Then what is the next thing? We need government investment in infrastructure. Of course, government is doing that. And if all of these things come together, then that is the foundation we have on which we have to build. And what is that we have to build? We have to make immense strides in technological development. We miss the industrial revolution bus because of colonization again. And we have been technology followers right throughout. After all, technology development is the vehicle that is going to take you up there. 80 years after independence almost, Again, we are technology followers. Our industry is still in that survival mode, like Indian people. We are in that survival mode. We want to get ahead no matter what. What rules we have to break, what compromises we have to make. This striving for excellence left us behind a long time back. Because I want everyone to actually ask that question. Do I strive for excellence in whatever I do? Similarly, our industry is in a survival mode. They are extremely risk averse. If I have to talk about defense, then today we are 
importing almost everything, sensors, high-end materials, electronics, so much more. And on top of that, we find it extremely difficult to get true development work done through our the biggest industrial houses that we have. They are not willing to take the risk. If you look at academia on the other side, then we have far too few people who are doing cutting edge research because there is a dearth of quality institutions. Now even if you look at our premier institutions, not only is there a shortage of faculty, today there is a severe shortage of PhD students. Why? No meaningful jobs in industry after a PhD. So this is truly a vicious circle and that needs to be broken and broken fast. Again, because a demographic dividend will be on our side only for a few more years. So we have to break this and make immense technological strides, fill the gaps in so many areas, uh, sustainable agriculture, biomedical research, energy storage and uh, energy generation, hot topic today, materials, sensors, AI, quantum computing, the list is varied and it's an exhaustive list. But let me tell you that this, making these strides in high technology is quite possible. I can tell you from my own experience. I, my area of work as was said during the introduction was, is composite materials. So I'll say a little bit about composite materials. Composite materials are essentially layered materials made of carbon fiber, glass fiber. You may be aware of carbon fiber uh, helmets and things like that. So these structures are made from layered materials like this and there is a resin in between which holds the whole thing together. And these are truly tailorable. You can make any size, shape and get best properties. So what are the applications? The applications are numerous. The aircraft you fly, I sh I'm showing a civil aircraft over here and a fighter aircraft. They are full of composites, sporting goods, wind turbine rotor blades, yachts, performance boats. So th there is a huge application. Now in the Indian context, this high-end structural composites is again a niche area. Most of the work goes on in with the patronage of government organizations like ours. And it's almost absent in industry. Now when I joined DRDO, r and engineers about two decades back, there was not much composites activity going on there. So I got a chance to start from scratch. I built my team, I trained them, I groomed them. They were raw, fresh engineers, but enthusiastic, like few of you in the audience. Now, let me tell you one more thing that 20 years back, what we were paid was much less than our, what our counterparts got in private jobs. But none of my team members has quit till date. I have my team intact. And I attribute that to good quality, exciting work that they got. So Indians do value quality. It is not only just about money. And today, this bunch of about a dozen scientists have done state-of-the-art cutting-edge work. We have developed manufacturing processes, 3D printing of continuous fiber composites, stealth, uh, fracture and fatigue, nanofiller hybridization, so on and so forth. So many, many cutting-edge areas, we, we are there and we are maybe at par or better than many of our Western, Western counterparts. So the message over here is, people like you and me can do this if given an opportunity and the right environment. So the strong message that I want to leave you with is that you have to believe in yourself. We have to believe in our capabilities. We have to be passionate about what you do, strive for excellence, but most of all, we have to be responsible citizens. Because if India has to rise like a phoenix and reach a status of that stratospheric status of developed nation, then all of us have to pitch in and pitch in big time consistently and honestly. So I will leave you with a beautiful picture from the James, taken by the James Webb Telescope. The James Webb Telescope, as you know, was birthed by science and is now giving birth to newer and newer science. Thank you.